where we uh, stopped last time was that uh, we had uh, x. X was a this was a Nakajima variety. And so on the Kajima variety, it's constructed, the way it's constructed, it's a, it's a quotient of something by uh, the geometric invariant theory quotient. So it's a JT quotient. All right. And the JT quotient is some, let me get more. A JT quotient is, by definition, it's approach of some some graded algebra. Go write it. Something like that. And so um, this this will always have a map to some variety. Maybe we call it X naught, which is which is ordinary affine quotient, i.e. the spec of the invariant. So that's the, that is the spec. Or not, these are invariants. G. And so then, um, and this were covariants, the R case. And so this is uh, this this variety is affine. And this map, so this is we'll focus on this map. This map is has two features. First, this map is projective. Particle proper, which is by definition. So this means the, fi the fibers of that are projective varieties, and also, also it's birational on to its image. So this may be. So this may be. Um, this map may not be subjective, but it is generically one to one with its image. And, the, and the, my favorite example of that situation is that if I have the simplest possible non trivial Nakajima variety is T star T1. So this looks like a P1. And then there's its cotangent bundle, which maybe I'll draw like that. Now, Sure, how to draw the cotangent bundle? Maybe I'll draw it like that. Something like that. <laughs> These are cotangent lines. <laughs> Doesn't look like lines, but uh, so if we the map this map here just blows down this P1 itself, and so you get a cone. Well, okay, so this is a cone, the usual, the usual quadric cone, so it's d u v equals w squared, something like that. So conversely, if you if you start with a cone and you blow up the the origin, of course you're going to get t star p one. And so this these two features are axiomatization, a kind of useful axiomatization, which is not, which is not exactly the kind of, you know, this is we will be talking about various modular vacuum and so forth in, in three dimensional theories. And this is this is slightly different axiomatization, uh, but very useful one. So this is this can be axiomatized as follows. X is called an equivariant symplectic resolution in 
if first x well we will do so it has three words in its in the title and so this would be uh this would be uh, well finish really word first first x symplectic is algebraic symplectic it's algebraic symplectic so this is uh, uh this is satisfied for Lagrangian uh, varieties i.e. for example eg eg could be eg a smooth algebraic complex reduction second It's a resolution of singularities, so there exists a map. If I take a map from X to the the easiest thing is if I take what what's, what should be X naught X naught, we can take as this pack of just so what what is X naught X naught if it's a fine algebraic variety, we can take it to be the spec of global functions if you want. So. Spec of global functions. On X, so this is projective. It's proper, maybe, and very rational. For us, it's the proper part that's important, but in the general development of theory, by rational also comes in handy. And second and third, X not does look like a cone, so there exists a there exists an automorphism. There exists one parameter group, maybe call it auto sigma of t in automorphisms of x. Well, automorphisms of x will also act on x naught. That contract contract x naught to a point. So this would be. So this is this is just this is just the action that. Uh, so if I in my t star p one example, I can I can contract the I can contract the cotangent bundles so the cotangent fibers so that would be the action by I mean, takes them all by a convention that scales it by this h minus in one and so this would contract the cone to the central point and this is uh, I don't want to develop I don't want to discuss the general theory of this but I very recommend very recommend reading so the good re an excellent reference for this is a paper by Tim Kaledian called um, I think called geometry and topology of symplectic resolutions. So that's Reason. But the the aspect the aspect we want to use from there is the following: is that the, there's the following theorem that I can constrict, consider what people call the Steinberg varieties. I mean, there's a theorem the following: consider the Steinberg variety variety of X, which is by definition. So this is X cross x over x naught so these are the i.e these are the pairs maybe if we call it this map if we call this map p this is this means we have pairs of points x1 and x2 such that the, the projection of x1 equals the projection of x2 so this is this is so this is this sits so uh, so far this is this is definition so far there's no statement definition and that so this is a sub set in x cross x and the statement is that this isotrope isotropic as usual where we have here we take 
with respect to so this is when we take when we talk about correspondences so these are sub varieties in in union of two lagrangian things and so this is with respect to this is always with respect to You take the symplectic form on X and you take the minus symplectic form on X. So, so, so that makes the diagonal isotropic. So that's diagonal. So EG diagonal is isotropic. It's always when you talk about Lagrangian and so forth correspondences. In particular, it's, it's dimension. So it follows that the dimension is at most the dimension of X and the top dimensional components. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that's and so now um now this is a very useful result for us because we will we will kind of axiomatize two different aspects of this, I suppose. Now now so we will we'll make the following definition. So now suppose Plus L is a correspondence between two different varieties. Is a correspondence and so I apologize. I kind of jumped over this this very important result. It's 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 it, 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 it is very powerful. It's a little bit complicated to prove, but it's uh, but it's uh, something we're going to use and then so um so then it we can we can we can ask we can demand so we can demand well well it can be i suppose it can be so maybe i'll say you know what are the properties it can be first well, Lagrangian. I should have calibrated my screen. My uh, maybe I'll make maybe I'll make like a like in the auto racing. We'll make a pit stop in the middle of the lecture. I calibrate my screen at some point. This is my pen is a bit off. Uh, so this correspondence could be Lagrangian. That's clear property, and also it could be what we call Steinberg. Steinberg, i.e., that that this L sits inside the product of X and Y over some V, which which is it's in a fine algebraic variety, and it's a, and we can always embed it in a vector space if we want, where 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 um, both X so we we don't need birational, we just need properness. So where both X and Y map to this V in the proper so both those both of those maps are proper. So this is if this two quant so this is this is a prototypical example of that is the Steinberg correspondence IE. So this would be this would be so this this is an example. Is the prototypical example. Okay, and so um. So why do we like why do we like this this things? Is that this this is Lagrangian Steinberg correspondences commute. With our matrices.
in the following sense. So this would be, this is why this is why we really like them. So if I have with our medicines, so in cohomology, so not not down commute, so if it's a full elliptic cohomology and it's a it's a whole it's a whole so this is so this, maybe I should spell this. So this is in cohomology. In ordinary cohomology. So if I just have some, so if I just have some correspondence, it doesn't define. So this maybe doesn't define for me. First of all, it it doesn't define for me a correspondence of the homology. In fact, I can even even in case here I have to. So this correspondence may be singular. But. It defines the curse, but it does act. Uh, it does act in cohomology, and so that's that's. And in cohomology, it commutes with our matrices. In, it's not. Uh, it's not the case that it commutes with our matrices. And in fact, so once you go to case theory in elliptic cohomology, very few things really commute with our matrices. But uh, in cohomology, it, the following is true. And how is this? How is this um, shown? So maybe this. Uh, so. So this is maybe first step for any, suppose if I have, if first let's, uh, so first the following definition. Um, let x be symplectic. Let act a a torus act on x preserving the symplectic form. form and then L in X Lagrangian. So then we can what we can do is we can define we can define like a so if we take the fixed points so then uh, if we take the fixed points of A or well, maybe Lagrangian A in Brand The fixed points on A, well, this means you intersect L with the fixed point set. So this would be so. Maybe I'll draw a picture. So here's here's my fixed point. Well, I'm not going to draw X. I'll just draw a fixed point set, which is smooth, symplectic X A, which is smooth symplectic. Now, if I hit it with a Lagrangian, then the intersection will have many, many different components. So maybe I'll draw something else to have a component like that, and then another component like that, whatever. Right? So this would be could be component. So this is if I take L fixed points, that could be a union of components. And but but they all since they well there was Lagrangian to begin with and we so this would be they all isotropic so at most so at most half dimensional and the top dimensional one Lagrangian therefore And then I would like to define um, a notion, which is like the residue of L. This would be a summation. So this would be so. This, so the definition. This is the thing that I want to define. This will be summation over Lagrangian components with some multiplicities. Well, you can say that maybe the components are which are not Lagrangian gas with multiplicity zero, if you want. So that this is. This is a multiplicity. Yeah. 
And so what is that uh what is that multiplicity? So if I look at the if I look at the general point of each one of these components, then okay, this is Lagrangian. And then if I look at the uh, at the normal bundle, it is also symplectic. So then there is this normal bundle, which means and so in that normal bundle I will have some some also Lagrangian thing. And so, and so then there is a there is a following clamor that the class so maybe call it so this this is little li and then there is a so if I already took a two-dimensional component then I've eaten up I've eaten up the uh, half of the dimension I I've eaten up you know however many dimensions I could take from from the fixed locus and then in the normal bundle I will have to have We'll have to have some dekaisotropic also of the maximal possible dimension, so that would be that would be means it's Lagrangian. And so this is there's a lemma, so maybe call it Fi. So the lemma says that we can if we look at the class of the Fi. So this is a class in where I um I look at the equivariant cohomology, a equivariant cohomology of of just the vector space of the fiber of the normal bundle at some maybe I take some point and call it f at the normal bundle at the point f. And so there's a lemma is that this class is always an integer multiple so this is some so this is a vector space this is this is a vector space and so this equivalent cohomology is is just a polynomial ring so this are polynomials Are polynomials. In in A, which is the Lie algebra of A. And so that, that polynomial is always a multiple of of um, if I take like a standard like that, for example, I take the class of um say attracting or repelling and the way to prove this lemma is to notice that all the coordinate Lagrangian all they equal up to a sign all coordinate Lagrangians are equal up to a sign that's 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 how you prove this lemma and so but then maybe this is slightly non-canonical and then maybe if I have a polarization better a better solution would be Better if I have a polarization, which we we, we have in our situation. We 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 compare it not with. So this is this is perfectly good choice, but it's better to not to refer to attracting the repelling direction, but refer to polarization. So you just take this polarization at that point there, and then maybe maybe non-trivial. You take you take the non-trivial the non-trivial weights in the polarization. This is okay. Again, the the gist of that is so. This is the gist of that. If I take okay, it's like in cohomology, there's a remarkable property that if I take a coordinate Lagrangian and the vector space, they all have the same they all have the same class in equivalent cohomology up to a sign, and so in particular, and 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 that that and then the corollary of that. Is that the class effect of any Lagrangian in a Korean homology 
of a point, this is going to be a, a multiple of a, of a coordinate Lagrange. And so uh, this is this is absolutely false in K theory, and so this is <laughs> the first thing <laughs> the first thing that goes wrong there. So this is <laughs> absolutely false in ecliptic homology, but in ordinary homology that is true. And so now I can I can state the following theorem. And so this is uh, so this is lemma. I mean, this, the reference for this lemma is is usual. As usual, this is in quantum groups, quantum cohomology, and Ethereum is also in this quantum group in quantum cohomology. This is it's been a while since I heard about this, but it's it's fun to re, it's fun to re, uh, to revisit that. And so. Uh, so what does the theorem say? The theorem, say, the theorem says, to, so suppose I have, suppose I have a correspondence. So suppose I have a correspondence between X and Y, which is, so this is a, I, I draw, um, as usual, I draw uh, a, an arrow, but I really mean a correspondence. So this is given by, this is Lagrangian, Steinberg correspondence. And then I have, I look at the fixed low psi, A equivalent. So then I can look at the fixed low psi. And here I have my stable envelope. And the stable envelope requires what? Requires a choice of, of attracting directions. So maybe I'll write C for this attracting directions. And then there's also the polarization. So this, is, this means the C is a cone choice of And then I have the same thing here. So here I choose polarization of Y, here I choose polarization of X. And now here, so this is a, this is now, a, um, this now sits in, uh, in the product. So I can take this residue. And when I take this residue, I have to take, use the polarizations of X, and maybe I take the opposite polarization of Y, I can't remember, maybe Y, maybe it's opposite polarization. Maybe it's not so particularly important, but it's just to get the sign right. And so then, uh, so this doesn't involve this construction only, so this is the polarization only affects a sign, and that's, uh, and to get the sign right, I think you have to do something like that. And then you put the, uh, maybe I put X guy, L and L. Point is that this is does not depend on C. On the, and so the statement is that commute commutes for all for all C. That's the statement. And and the corollary of that is then of course. that this residue L commutes with all R matrices. Because R matrix, what is R matrix? You go along this arrow and you come along, uh, or maybe this, is, maybe this is not right. It's like saying, <laughs> this is corollary is that if I take this, this residue of L and I apply it after the R matrix for X, I get the R matrix for Y after the residue. So this commutes with that sign. Right. 
So this this intertwines. I mean, this means intertwines our matrices. For example, if x equals y, it commutes it commutes with our matrices. And how do you prove this? Well, you prove it by uh, by the usual by uh, we've basically stable envelopes are 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 made to prove things by by uh, uh, rigidity, and this is a rigidity computer. And how do you compute this by rigidity is that you use use Steinberg for properness and then send send the variables send a in a to infinity. And this is to say you want to prove that this arrow equals that arrow. To prove two errors are equal, and then, well, this is a composition of three things. Namely, you take a stable envelope, you take uh, you take the, the, the correspondence, and you take the inverse to the stable envelopes. But the inverse of the stable envelope is the stable envelope for the opposite. So this is like the, the stable envelope inverse or inverse transpose. Minus transpose for the opposite for everything. Right. So then, if you'd like, so if you'd like this, this this is a composition of three correspondences. You use the fact that this is one of them, the middle one, is a Steinberg correspondence to conclude that this, in fact, a proper integral. It's a proper integral of correct dimension, and you send the very current variables to infinity to to say that this is uh, this is in fact what you get here. Again, so this this is super powerful because well I don't know I mean you will be the judge with the powerful not but this tells you that our matrices will commute with a lot of things in cohomology well not with a lot but but we have a systematic way to produce things with produce objects that commute with our matrices in cohomology and this is um, and this is we've uh, so um, so for Nakajima Kaura. So e.g., maybe I'll maybe I'll just start with an example. This example we will need anyway. So example. So our goal is to talk about quiver with one vertex and one loop, and then and then this is m. Um, so this is traditional. Then, if you use if you use this notation, then you get one. You get one v one and one w one, and you denote them as n e r. So they denote x v one w one. This denoted as m. R n, this are moduli spaces of certain sheaves of sheaves f on C two or P one or P two of rank R and C two of f equals n, e.g. m one n. This are this we're talking about shifts of rank one, and that's that's the these are the just ideals in the space of polynomials in in in, in ring of polynomials into variables, and then. C two of that ideal is co-dimension, and so this we're talking about the Hilbert scheme of endpoint. Okay, and so um, 
in here, well, maybe I should say which sheath. Okay, so this is this is uh, um, so you take certain means they have to be torsion free. And framed. Framed means framed means you have um, I apologize. Framed means you have a shift on framed at infinity. Infinity means maybe at line at infinity, maybe like like L infinity. This is P2 minus C2. And then you take um, friend means you take F and you restrict it to this line at infinity that has to be a sum of copies of the structure shift R copies this line is infinity. And in fact, so the part of the data is this isomorphism, call it phi, sorry, this is has to be an isomorphism and we call this isomorphism phi. And then the, the point is that if I take the, um, the GLR, GLR acts on this space, just changing the basis in the trivial. And so this is the, this is the, if I take a maximal torus in here, then, then M, R N, maybe I'll just how about I abbreviate M R. It's a disjoint union over all N M R N, and then if I take M R and I take a maximum, so this is this is we call it framing torus. That is product. This makes that shift to be direct sum. Times, and the corresponding locus is where you shift F is a direct sum from I goes from one to R of this ideal shift of rank one. So that's, and so now, what is the um, what's the uh, um, what's the correspondence I want to consider? Any time we talk about modular F shift, there's always this there's always this uh, correspondence given by um, given by uh, short exact sequences of shifts. So, so I would like would like to say, well, how about the following correspondence? So then we can have a correspondence between, maybe we take M, Rn, and then C2. We have like have a correspondence, maybe you call it alpha. <laughs> alpha, people call it minus K. It's just to just to this is just to confuse people. So it's it's like a crazy it's people you know, somehow. R N plus K. And so what is this? What's it gonna be? So here I have a here I have a sheaf F um F uh, or we'll call it maybe F1. 
here I have a shift F2, and here I have a point P. And then what I like is I'd like F2 to be a subshift, so I have a short exact sequence. So this goes to F1. And so then the quotient would be a torsion shift because they have the same rank. So it has to be a rank zero shift, so a torsion shift. Supported. at this point P. Okay. So that's a correspondence. You can you can you can imagine this is given by some I mean this is this is the shift being in a subshift and some some kind of equation. And uh, the fact that the quotient is uh supported at the point is also an equation. So this gives you some some sort of equation. And now, so I claim that this is, um, this is in fact, is, is a Lagrangian Steinberg correspondence. And so this is this this correspondences. Maybe I should attribute this. This correspondences were first studied by by Nakajima in rank one, and then Baranowski for rank bigger than one, and many other people. In general, this is this is a, there's a whole machinery of correspondence like this. If you have a modular shift, you can always have this kind of this sort of correspondence. You can in, instead of saying well, this is a torsion shift support at the point, you can make some other wishes about the torsion shift, and that would be that would be a correspondence. And so, how do we see that it's like Randon and Steinberg? And the way and the argument is always we take it we take it. Uh, we take it and embed it into the canonical, the canonical thing. Namely, we embed them both. We put them both into, I apologize, there will be some sort of interesting topology of errors here. We put them both into M R plus one, and then N plus K. And the way we embed this one is we'll we take F1 and then direct some, any shift, any, any, some fixed shift supported, which we translate to, so we, we have to have some fixed ideal shift translated to P. Okay, that, that's, and here we take it, so this would be, so the way you you fix, you pick your favorite shift support at the origin and it translates to a point P, which is, okay, that's that's an embedding of C2 into uh, into uh, shifts on here, and then you compare it with, with F2. And here we take just the structure shift. And so where would they where would they um where would they go? What's the map? What's the map to uh the affine quotient? The map to affine quotient, so if I have the map M R N, the corresponding map to M. R and maybe call it zero. This is the Ullenbach space. Space, it takes F, takes the shift F, 
takes it to a double dual. This is a vector bundle. And then it's, so every shift sits in its double dual, and then you take the quotient, you take, remember the support. Of the quotient, yeah. this is this is a uh, this is a torsion shift. So every so that's and it's clear that this have the same double dual. I mean, this is this 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 data. This data satisfies of so if if something if if f two sits inside f one and the quotient distortion, then the double dual is the same. And so then it's so this is so they, they come and they they both map to the same point. So this is F double do the same point, and then you take uh, whatever some whatever they were whatever this is same thing here. So this is this is Steinberg. It is isotropic because it sits inside the bigger Steinberg variety. And so the Stein, bigger Steinberg variety is, is Steinberg and isotropic. I had the question, so maybe I'll check that. So this is you think you take some ideal, some ideal you like, and it's an ideal on C two, and then C two acts there by translation, and you just translate it there. That makes sense. Do you mean that there's a singularity of this shift in point P? So you had some, you take any ideal shift, which is the scheme supported at zero, and you just translate it to by P. P is a, P is a vector in C2. You can translate anything in C2 by, by P. Sorry, but I thought that I is ideal shift, not like torsion shift concentration. Yeah, but you can, you can take ideal shift and translate it too. And just, just change. <laughs> Um, well, if you want the concrete, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> concrete. Don't you want a concrete? It. No, I mean, we want a concrete example. Let's say, let's say, if, uh, if P has coordinates P one, P two, so maybe P has coordinates P one and P two, and I take something like x one minus P one and x two minus P two to the k to the k. Take an ideal generated by this, e.g. This is one example. What? What makes sense? Okay, I mean, like this is singular. This shift is not locally trivial near point P. That, right? Is that what you mean? You, mean? you take some point with some point which has something defined something at zero of length k, and then you just translate, just really change variables. This is what. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's. So this is, and the only thing to com compute is that this is in fact is this correspondence in fact is middle dimensional. So that's some computation. So so we but we put it in some bigger space. And that uh, and that bigger space is uh, is uh, you know we know it's isotropic and we know it's Steinberg, and the only and so this is so this it follows. So it, it then and then since we put it in a bigger space, it follows that isotropic and Steinberg. And then take it plus, in fact, middle dimensional. This means this. This implies it's a Lagrangian standard correspondence. The dimension, it's not a hard, difficult computation, but something you check in dimension of the space. Okay. 
Okay. And so now this says, what does it say? That if I take, what is, what's going to be the residue of, of this object? So if I compute, like if I compute, remember I have M R M1. So if I have like M2, sorry, M2 sits inside M2 fixed locus with respect to the framing torus is M1 cross M1. And and we would like to know what is the residue of this of this operator. It's pretty it's pretty obvious that <clears throat> the fixed the actual fixed locus it's going to be so it's up to so this is this is this is pretty clear that if you look about support this is going to be alpha minus k tensor one with some coefficient plus some other coefficient alpha one tensor alpha minus k, right? Because it just this has to be supported on the fixed locus of the actual fixed locus of the correspondence. Well, the actual fixed locus are where the things are direct sums. And when you take direct sums, if I have a, you know, it has to be something of this kind. And the coefficient is one because the coefficient, well, maybe is is maybe plus minus one because there's a smooth point. So let's go back to this, let's go back to this definition of the residue here. So it's clear that if I have, if if in this singular guy, if, I, if there is a, if there is a point on my Lagrange, there's a fixed point on my Lagrange, which is smooth, then this coefficient has to be plus minus one. Because so this is, so this is maybe all right. Maybe I noted here. So plus minus one if there is a smooth point. On HLR. And the the polarization is a you know how you you uh you arrange polarization so that it's actually one. And so this is in the end you get one. And so this is conclusion that this operator commutes. <clears throat> so this, these operators. Commute with our matrices. Okay. So now, how do these operators act? So then, this is maybe maybe I'll you know maybe I'll make a slight change in my in the plan of the lecture since I want to talk. About, I mean, I was planning to talk slightly a little more generally about this Lie algebra, but let's just let's just talk about just this concrete this concrete example here at hand. So this is this 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 Nakajima operators they satisfy relation of the kind that if I take alpha k so this is well you define define alpha k for k bigger than zero as some kind of transpose. 
server correspondence and you have some sign, you make a transpose of correspondence. And then the way you, uh, the way the sign is arranged so that you get the commutation relation of the kind that I get the, um, the alpha, uh, alpha k commutator alpha l is is what <clears throat> first by this formula since the by this formula it's enough to compute it in rank one and so in then in general rank this will be just so that they can that, that clear that the way this this acts in in the way this acts if our if i compute it in rank r then it will be just r times times whatever rank because if I compute if I can if I want to commute this operator in rank two I just pick two independent commutators from sorry we'll go, let's go back to the theorem I will state it here here this so this the stable envelopes they are isomorphisms up to up to localization they're isomorphisms. So if I want to compute the commutator here, you might as well compute the commutators of the residues. So the residues are the residues here. Well, it'll be just the rank because they are independent term. Then you should get in principle you should get some sign, but in fact you get you get k. So the correct commutation relation, which is which is there's some signs, and then the signs are important in the business, but I'm not I mean not important enough to discuss them here. And so that maybe I'll just put k here. And then uh delta k plus L. And then remember we had we had also this was a correspondence which had the C two sitting around. So there was uh, so maybe I'll I'll write it like the diagonal. Diagonal in C2. Meaning this 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 each one of them has a label in C2. There's a C2 here, and C2 there. So in principle, so you can put any cohomology any querying cohomology class from that C2, but uh you can also leave that C2 is just invalidated, right? So for example, if you're supposed you do this this kind of operators on on uh on a surface which is you know a complicated surface maybe like a k3 surface then then you don't you just you have a correspondence which one of the factors is the surface itself and as you compose them you get more surfaces and you just leave it there and so that's so uh, this is the get the diagonal here and so in particular and also they if i take If I take um, direct sum, or maybe I'll take an occurring homology, so take, I don't need the if then, so take a current homology of my space M1. So this is, let me spell it out, it's summation over N, current homology. We don't have to be specific about which torus act. Right, so this is this is where these operators act. So this is in fact a fog module. For these operators. And in particular, irreducible. Okay, so now we have the R matrix that commutes. We decided that the R matrix, so the R matrix is some operator. R matrix is supposed to operate in this. M1 chromosome, M1 tensor M1, 
cohomology of the fixed locus. So this commutes with alpha, I'll just write alpha plus n, where alpha plus n, where, where, where I define alpha plus minus n, if I want to preserve the exact same commutation relations, then maybe I write it alpha n tensor one plus minus one tensor alpha n. And if I want to exact same commutation relation, maybe I put square root of two, but that's, that's you know, not really needed. <laughs> So you everything is defined over can be defined over integers. You don't need you don't need to rush analysis like that. But let's just if you want somehow want to compare with uh, computation with, uh, with the exact same. <clears throat> and so and so this is this commutes with that. And so according to this alpha plus, and so this kind of this maybe I'll write, maybe I just note this, denote this fork. So I have my fork, tensor fork, and I can write it as fork plus tensor fork minus. According to the action, so this alpha, this is where, this is where alpha plus n acts and this is where alpha minus n acts. They, they, they commute. So this is alpha plus n commutator. Okay. And so that means since our matrix commute Serial matrices commute with uh, with uh, so so our matrix commutes with everything here. This is irreducible. And this is and this is where therefore where the R matrix acts. So and since it acts irreducible, it's some kind of expression. In alpha minus n. So the the maybe the uh, <clears throat> maybe the analogy is if I take the ordinary R matrix, which you the, the simplest possible R matrix, maybe if you if you know if you didn't slice it different. If I take R of u to be one minus some permutation over u, something like that, <clears throat> then this acts, I can normalize it so that it acts trivially in the symmetric things and and somehow slightly non-trivially in the anti-symmetric thing. And similarly here, this is if I have here, I'm talking about the space of two bosons and I, and this is, so this is, uh, this is like the center of mass. So if I have a kind of two bosons, maybe I'll just remove whatever. Alpha one and alpha two. Okay, now let's call it truth. So this is this is like the center of mass. So alpha, in fact, alpha is is the derivative of boson. Maybe call it f t t one t two. So this is like the center of mass. And this is a relative position. And so the R matrix only acts in the space, doesn't doesn't act on the space which is center of mass, and and acts only in the part where it's uh, where it's a relative position. And how does it act? So this is uniquely determined. And so then it's a lemma. This is uniquely determined. Any any expression uh, 
in alpha n minus is uniquely determined. By uh, by its matrix elements, in in the following subspace, you take you take the vacuum, which is which is the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme of zero points, cross Fox space. So this you take. So, so I'm not saying it's preserved. It doesn't preserve. This this is subspace is not preserved. But if I take if I take a matrix element, if I take the vacuum vacuum matrix element in the first thing, I get a map from POC to POC. Okay, so this is, would be this is like R matrix. You take a vacuum vacuum matrix element and then whatever whatever in the second choice. And so this would be an operator from fog to fog, <clears throat> and this is an operator from fog to fog, and I'm thinking it's a linear isomorphism between operators from fog to fog here and operators from fog to fog there. It's meant to, <clears throat> easy to believe, it's a linear map. But these are, these guys, this is, we've discussed this, the vacuum vacuumatic element, these are operators. Of Cup products. Vacuum vacuum matrix elements of an R matrix is a cup product by some <coughs> characteristic class. Of of the tautological bundle. In particular, <clears throat> starting with uh, starting with so if I take so remember we had this this this, this sort of discussion so if I have a, if I had some if I had some bundle which with churn classes W maybe call it W I and then you put whatever plus U. And then maybe take a ratio or something like that. Okay. Then this, if we expand that as u infinity, this starts with one plus the next term would be uh, like uh, h bar over u times the rank plus the next term would have you know in one over u squared term. There would be some expression that involves c1, you know, some coefficient. Some coefficient times C1 plus some other coefficient times rank plus so on. Rank is just the number. So this is I goes from one to the rank. And so, in particular, if we start with the R matrix, you get an expression which is of the form. You know, like I said, first the rank and so on and so forth. Okay, the rank of the tautological bundle, that's easy. So how do we decode the rank? The rank, so the rank rank of the tautological bundle. What is the tautological bundle? That's just N. And the way and you can write it as as an expression in and alphas of the following kind is just summation over k bigger than zero. You get things like um, alpha minus k times alpha k, this sort of thing. Hmm. I mean, up to up to constant. So this is this is uh, an elementary observation about uh, about the Heisenberg algebra that if I have uh, if I if I act in the Fock module if I act by an operator like that that remembers 
the numbers, the uh, just the total. Well, I guess in this language would be total momentum, but some other. So that's no. Maybe up to normalization, which we maybe not don't care at the moment. And so the, the conclusion is is that the that the that the R matrix and so then this so from this. The conclusion is that R of U is starts the classical R matrix. It's just something like H bar over U. If I remember correctly, that's summation. You can uh, you can write it like a summation of alpha minus n alpha n minus. This sort of thing. And again, there's a, there's a diagonal. You have to put the diagonal of C2. Meaning in usual notation, if you, if you take, if you split, if you take the splitting of, if you use the splitting of the diagonal of C2, then maybe you write something like, you can write, you can choose any splitting, but if you're, if you're um, if you if you write Nakajima operators as having a homology classes in some brackets, so that would be more this diagonal would give you something like alpha minus m minus and then a point. Any splitting of the diagonal is good. So for C two, I can split like that: a point and and one, or one and point, or line and line, and then just so there are many ways to split the diagonal for C two. Okay, and so now we're um, at the point which is it's kind of an important point. Maybe I'll make that point and then I come back to. So this we will not talk about the full R matrix today because we don't we don't have enough time for that. But in fact, you can compute the full R matrix one. So there is one step. In fact, somehow. And the way and the way the way it's um, the way it's going to be, it's going to be like this. So we take the so so what does Young? I'm going to just write Young Bach's equation. Young Bach's equation says r one two r R one two of U one minus U two R one three over U one minus U three R two three of U two minus U three equals R two three U two minus U three and so forth. Okay. And then this equation we can uh we can we can analyze this equation in the limit where u1 goes to infinity. In the constant term where u1 is really is infinity, then you get you get one you get an empty statement, right? So in the so if u1 is literally infinity, then it's okay. Somehow nothing nothing. Nothing says because this matrix is one, this is one, and so this is not so interesting. Then you take the coefficient of one over u. 
So what that would be say? It does will say the coefficient of one over u that says that says that gives a useful equation which we already know anyway. So this is says that r one two plus r one three commutes with two r three. This says this says the r matrix commutes with some correspondence. So this is for us for us this is this is this is going to be we already commuted the r matrix. This this says that says the r matrix commutes. R commutes with Nakajima Baranovsky operators. Which we which we know knew anyway. So we will already argue the whole the whole class of discussion about this this sort of the consequences of that. And then and then if we take the if we take the coefficient of one over u square, then you get then we get something here times r two three equals r two three something there, which is this is which is now really not the same. And this is really not the same because this is this will be this will be a part this will be at the moment where something this is no longer I mean it's not the same operator on two sides and so that says the R two three is an intertwiner between two things and so this is and so that's not the same it has to do and then fact it has to do. With the operator of with multiplication by C one of the tautological on uh, M two. So this is this is what it really says. Describe me how unravel what this thing is. And the commute the and so this is when we compute one over U squared coefficient, we have to know what is the how does the C one of the tautological, what is this really operator is, and and what it is, it some has to do. So this will compute, and that has to do with some virus or And this has been our virus or acting in this fog minus part. So we had. And we had we had the same two and it's Kahmoji, sorry. The you know, there's kind of there is this fog square of the fog space, which we can write as fog plus tensor fog minus and the various sorrow acts here. Right, so well that's something we'll compute. And so once it's once it's once we make this computation, this coefficient here, it says this this R two thing, this guy here, this operator is a certain. Very sorry, interesting. Namely, and to some operator that has certain property with respect to the action of Verisor. But this, this, the Verisor here acts irreducibly. And we'll see also, it's not, it's not, it's not difficult. And so therefore this operator already in this one over u square coefficient, this operator is uniquely determined. So this means if I have some something that intertwines, it yeah, has some kind of intertwining property with respect to an irreducible action, that is that is determined. So already that says in the Young Baxter equation, already one over u square coefficient, one over u one sorry, u one 
already this cartridge and determines the R matrix. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's some computation we'll have to do, and we'll do it. So it's a very useful computation. And the fact that there is a very sorrow, it's kind of now it's not surprising after this formula here. This is this is after all this L naught of the very sorrow, or whatever two L naught, or and that is the same. This is that. L not minus kind of thing expression. So that's not the fact that we see it here. It's not particularly surprising. And so, uh, but let me let me go back so just and and talk a few things about maybe some slightly more general remarks here about since we um, so um, and before I do this, maybe I need a drink of water. So, in general, if you have a Nakajima varieties, so the Nakajima varieties are some uh, representations of quivers. On representational quivers, there is an operation of the direct sum. So this is, you know, we, we discussed this last time. It's very easy. So if I have a M, uh, M of uh, V1, W1, <laughs> I must be getting tired. Direct product M V2, W2, this embed by direct sum into M of V1 plus V2, V1, W1 plus W2. Okay. And that direct sum also says that this is a fixed locus as a, as a fixed locus sum torus action, if you want. So, okay. And and similarly, we can have uh, we can we can have a different embedding here. So we can put M some different splitting V1 prime W1 prime cross M V2 prime W2 prime. Might as well do that. Somehow nothing nothing prevents us from doing this. Would be <coughs> And so, and so then we can have, if we take the Steinberg for as long as, as long as they sum up to the same thing, this is okay. And so then if we take the Steinberg correspondence in the middle, it gives it. So we have a Steinberg. Steinberg in the middle. This will restrict to some correspondence between these two things. It's just like we said, we took we took a, we took a shift of a certain rank, an ideal shift, and then shift of a certain rank, an ideal shift. So this would be this, this would be, and we took so, no, so this would be a standard correspondence between these things. And so if we pick some, if we find some Lagrangian component, and if some we pick some two-dimensional component in there, then this would be this would be a correspondence we like. And so, in particular, so in particular will be uh, the the kind of the we discussed. We talk about uh, um, uh, so we define action of quantum groups as taking matrix elements of uh, of R matrix, and the matrix elements of classical R matrix they're taking. Uh, this means you take uh, they define action of Lie algebra, and so in particular, what we one can do is there is a particular correspondence, namely if I take M, maybe call it some uh, some maybe call it alpha, and whatever some W naught cross M V W. So and then there is a particular correspondence. Like, there is a particular Lagrangian state of correspondence that uh, this will take it to M, and I'll write zero W naught. Well, that's a point. It's not. It's not. It's here for just for accounting, so that uh, so that we um, 
so that we don't get confused and so across m alpha plus e m w and so there's a there's a particular correspondence namely that just are are um, are some components of the stable envelope there's a there's a this is a fixed locus of some this is this is a fixed locus of some torus action that acts since we we split write w maybe make it make it uh make a torus act here make a or act here by scale So these are two different components of, of the fixed locus inside this bigger thing. And so in particular, we have our stable envelope. So this maybe looks like this. So. And there's some kind, of, some kind of attracting manifold here. And then it hit <laughs> my favorite picture. So it's clear that stable envelope is going to be is going to be supported on uh, on something which is which is uh, which sits inside the stable variety. Right, this is because it's the stable variety contracts. I mean, the correspondence given by the stable envelope it it you know have a complete you know, have a complete curve joint to things that sits inside the stable variety. So the stable envelope is a, is sits inside that the correspondence we want. So this is and it would take in particular inside inside the support of the stable envelope, this would be we can choose for in particular here we can choose just the the classical part. Or the one half of the class climatic or whatever upper so upper lower diagonal part well of R the class climatic that would be <clears throat> that would be supported is supported on uh, on the Lagrangian time correspondence. Okay, and so that's uh, that's. <clears throat> It's very general, like I said, the, the action of our Ali algebra is a given very generally by, by this sort of thing. You take, again, if there's a particular correspondence, namely, you, uh, you compute it, uh, it's, it's given by uh, all possible Lagrangian components of the support, and this coefficient given by whatever the coefficient that appears in the classical R matrix. Okay. So this, this, this gives, The action of the algebra G, and then uh, so G G does itself by itself doesn't act by Lagrangian correspondence, but it's given. You have to take the coefficients by taking the coefficients in this auxiliary space. In fact, so this is, in fact, this is, this is, there's a Cartan part here of this Lie algebra and, and the root parts, and the roots are exactly, so the non zero roots, and this is the, that's this alpha. And so that's this alpha here. 
And so when we take the coefficients, you can you can say, well, which coefficients do we take? And then um, and then the answer is the following: you have to take. Let's do this. Uh, let's do this. This you can take. You can consider a silly case of this correspondence. You can consider it like that. Um, to zero, just take W out and then go to um, zero not cross. It's not. It's not. It's not too silly. It's some. It's some correspondence of this general thing. So this means they sit inside. Again, they sit. They just sit like before. They sit inside two different components of the fixed locus, and you look at the at the attracting directions, and they they the possible attracting direction hit them. There, this would be a little bit some correspondence, and that uh, you you look at this Lagrangian component, and with certain integer coefficients, this Lagrangian components define you this. So in a, in a sense, it's a special case. But the point is that this correspondence here, maybe we'll call it P, then the young boxer equation implies that P square. So since so this is this is well, strictly speaking, P goes from one space to another, but it's clear that you can compose it. So P square is like minus the value of W and alpha times P. So this is up to up to normalization as a projector. This is up to a constant, properly normalized. So P projects. It's kind of this, 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 that's, that's kind of an important equation here. So P projects. onto the image of G alpha. Well, in Kachmolch. So if you want to know, so if you want to know, uh, what, how big is your Lie algebra? You have to study things like this. And there's a kind of a loop here. We, uh, so I'm, I'm over time here, but the, 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 uh, <clears throat> it, maybe there's the first, our first link of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, with the numerous of geometry is that this is, if you think about this, this P or maybe this, Maybe this correspondence that let's call it action. Act. Act. Both P and Act are <laughs> are um, come from. Maybe come from the more precise thing are residues. A residues in the in the case in in the sense we discussed the residues of some equivalent correspondence, namely of the correspondence you take two point lie. On a curve, on a rational curve, to Greek. So there's this following. There's a there's a, another source of correspondences, and uh, in the world, is then you can make. Two points of an algebraic variety belong to a correspondence if they lie on such and such curve. And in particular, so the Gromwitten theory and the other theories are great sources of correspondence of the following of this kind. And it's clear that any such correspondence will be standard because any, any curve, any complete curve will be contracted to a map to a fine variety. 
And if you arrange the dimensions right, so this is be this of course this is correspondence. There's a virtual cycle is needed to define it. So. Virtual cycles need to define, but there is some correspondence, and if you arrange virtual dimensions correctly, this would be a Lagrangian correspondence. And so, um, so that's a, and that Lagrangian correspondence. So this would be <coughs> so. In general, so that in general, this so. Well, so in general, this correspondence P is some complicated object, but for. So maybe I'll say it here. For um, the quiver with a loop can be eyeballed directly. Directly. And then you should be able, and this, this is reproduces the formula for R. Right. So what, what are we supposed to, what, what one supposed to find? So this is an exercise I invite everybody to do. So this is this is what we're supposed to find for 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 queer one loop. In our we're supposed to find the Lie algebra, which is a root, each root space is one dimensional spanned by the corresponding alpha m. And so this this p is supposed to be this is supposed to be a very uh, very simple operator, namely it just it just projects to that alpha m inside. The, so this 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 p is just so this is so maybe alpha is. Sorry, alpha is bad notation here. I apologize. So this would be whatever. So too bad. Maybe call it beta. Call it gamma. Gamma, gamma. And so then, so this is for the quiver of alpha. P should be just. P should be just alpha minus n alpha n type of thing. Rather, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, okay, sorry, I'm usually severely over time. I stop here and I'll uh, I'll take questions. All right, maybe to warm you up for questions, there's a there next week. There's some there's some kind of panel which I have to participate, and that's been scheduled like years ago. And so there is if you go to the to the chat attached to the channel for this course. There is a there is a there is a poll there concerning possible options what to do next week, and uh, so right now I, I see six votes in that poll. Uh, we'll uh, so this I invite I I encourage everybody to vote so that we can have a clear idea what to do next week. And now back to questions. Has there been any kind of advances in understanding why this Virasoro might show up? Say again? The, the Virasoro algebra that shows up that you mentioned earlier, uh -huh. have there been any like advances in understanding why it shows up or can you see this in, in K-theory or elliptic cohomology in some way? Um. <laughs> so, um, I uh, maybe this this question is more uh, should be kind of a little bit turned on its head a little bit. Uh, namely, uh, I think there's there's a, there's a very good understanding of why there is there is uh, situation which Virasoro used to show up. They're uh, related to this to this uh, to this particular situation. Why they should be seen as some particular limit cases of what we're doing of this quantum group. So the statement is that this is maybe the question is so we, we we're talking about we want to like a quantum group. So we have a we constructing some quantum group has to do the rational the rational or cohomological R matrix. For this one loop, that should give us a quantum group, which is kind of like the Yangian of GL one hat, which is this is the algebra, 
this is the algebra generated by our alpha amp. So that's uh, so, right. <clears throat> and inside, in the inside of this algebra, if I have a if I have an algebra, then uh, so this is a deformation. So this is a deformation of just the universal developing of like g attached to some variable t, where g is this g is this Lie algebra here. And so in particular here, there are some elements like, you know, like T times alpha N. And where do they go here? So, so maybe I'll, so this is G, this is generated by alpha N. And this T times alpha N, they go to a very sort of algebra. Okay, so we, maybe to recapitulate, we have we have something which is supposed to look like a, a deformation of real developing of polynomials with values in the Lie algebra. We computed that Lie algebra to be this GL1 hat, and then therefore uh, this whole quantum group would be something which should be called the Yangian of GL1 hat. And then uh, if we if we look at the this T, where does the T come from? T G itself, remember G itself was coming from G comes from coefficients one over U. And so this comes from the coefficients of one over U square. So if we expand if it, we expand our matrix to the order of one over U square, which is gonna get new operators, which will which will basically very sort of operators. And so, uh, and so then the question is that why is this, uh, why is this, uh, why is this algebra, you know, why is there various or maybe the the answer I would maybe it's not going to answer Noah's question, but it will be express my opinion that it's 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 more of a it's more of a uh, uh, you know we're trying to explain. Something in terms of something else. This this is very uh, path dependent, meaning depends on what you've seen before. And uh, Verisor we typically see in well in conformal field theories and various uh, things that has to do with uh, quantum field theories in two dimensions. And uh, I think, I mean, in my it's my personal opinion, but maybe shared by by many, that all these phenomena are now somehow understood deep more deeply and. Uh, and uh, maybe more fundamentally, as coming in fact from some geometry in higher dimensions, in particular for from um, from the kind of uh, three-dimensional theories we're discussing here, and maybe even higher dimensional, and so on and so forth. And so it's more of a question. Uh, this this particular algebra explains this particular this, this particular algebra somehow explains not only Verisor but also explains on all things. Uh, maybe somehow in terms of discussion that you can ask. For whatever t to the, you can ask for kind of t to the. Uh, so Verisor algebra, it's it's like a W algebra for uh, for SL two or GL two. If you, so if you, but then you can. All right, GL two maybe here. But you get the W algebras or other GLRs here and so forth. So forth. I mean, if you if you if you look at the deeper into this quantum group, you get them all. And so that's a that's more of a question of, like I said, finding your finding what you used to before inside some richer and bigger structure, rather than rather than um, rather than the other way around. I don't know if it's a good answer to, but anyway. And can you see this inside of UQ GL1? Uh, so uh, there is this uh, QW algebra that sits there, right? So this this slightly more I mean, slightly more involved, uh, but it's it's there, right? This is we should we should ask uh, Nigutz, uh, Andre Nigutz to come and get lecture on that stuff. It's, uh, well, that's, 
but that's there, yeah. Thanks. Sure. Well, more questions? If otherwise, let's uh, let's see what we're going next, what we're doing next week. I encourage everybody to vote. And uh, well, if I get, I guess we're not gonna. If there's a, if there's a lot of opposition having a class next week, then maybe we'll. we'll I mean, it's not like the. Well, we'll see how we'll see how the votes distribute, and then we'll make a decision. All right. That's uh, then all for today. I thank everybody for uh, for sticking with me in this complicated journey.